The next business is the election of a speaker. I call the member for Braddon. Clerk of the House, members, it's with great pleasure and much pride that I nominate the member for Scullin, Mr Harry Jenkins, to be Speaker of the House uh, of Representatives and move that uh, he take the chair as uh, Speaker of this House in this, the 42nd Parliament. Harry has been in public service for nearly 30 years. He was born in Melbourne in 1952 and Harry's close family life was marked by community service and involvement, most often centred around his father's medical practice and later parliamentary career. Harry succeeded his father, Harry Senior, as the member for Scullin in 1986 after his father had served the electorate with distinction from 1969 to 1986. Not only this, but today Harry will emulate his father who was Speaker of this House from 1983 to 1986. Harry Jenkins, Jr. won Scullin in a by-election in 1986 after a long stint in local government as a councillor between 1979 and 1986, two of which he served as Shire President. Before entering Parliament, Harry had graduated with a Bachelor of Science from the ANU and was working for the Department of Veteran Affairs. His interest in all things science and particularly uh, the environment has not waned in the meantime. Harry has been re-elected to what we affectionately call Fortress Scullin in eight successive elections, consolidating the seat for Labor in 2007 by 20 per cent, a testimony to his dedicated hard work over many years and also that of his family. Harry has been a great servant of his electorate, his beloved Labor Party and especially this parliament. He has chaired and or has been an active member of over 14 standing joint statutory or joint select committees of the House of Representatives and the parliament. Equally, his representation of this parliament overseas has been widespread and carried out with distinction. However, Harry's special contribution to and recognition within the parliament has been associated with his long-term work as deputy and, deputy and second deputy speaker, a role he has carried out with great distinction, dignity and equanimity. Indeed, many an MP like myself, very ignorant of a particular standing order <laughs> or indeed of parliamentary procedures, <laughs> has been seen gravitating uh, in the chamber towards the ever-composed figure of Harry to take instruction. Order. <laughs> it's the type of voice you need, Harry. Harry's warm personality, great depth of character, mischievous sense of humour and calmness of mood and manner, along with his encyclopaedic knowledge of parliamentary processes, are richly and deservedly rewarded today. It couldn't have happened to a better person. Members, the speaker-to-be star sign is Leo. And I'd ask you to suspend any disbelief you may have in astrological predictions to ponder the following characteristics of Harry's star. Your fighting spirit is second to none. Nothing gets in the road of your ambitions, so it is quite clear that you will achieve what you set your heart upon. You desire the best. So while you could be happy in life um, with a life where you follow other people's rules and regulations, read the standing orders for that, mostly you'll much prefer your own trail. This means you will carve out your niche and make a name for yourself, and you will without doubt make your mark in the world. You can reach the top of the ladder no matter what field you choose. Harry, you have chosen the speakership as your field and your peers in this parliament have unanimously supported you in this endeavour. Our very best wishes accompany you in this task, and none more so than mine. Is the motion seconded? Will the member for Capricornia. Thank you, Clerk of the House. 
I'm delighted to have this opportunity to second the nomination of the member for Scullin to be the Speaker of the House for the 42nd Parliament. And uh, how wonderful it is to join with the member for Braddon uh, in having this honour. Welcome back. All members would agree with me that the member for Scullin is exceptionally well qualified for the role of Speaker. His family will be very proud to see him follow in the footsteps of his father the and former Speaker, Dr Harry Jenkins. And of course, the member for Scullin has himself served with great distinction as the Deputy Speaker and Second Deputy Speaker since 1993. He will continue to distinguish himself in his new role through his great respect for the parliament and his unrivalled knowledge of the standing orders. Those credentials will give uh, Harry authority over the chamber, but it's the uh, ever so slightly raised eyebrow, the wry smile and the absolutely deadpan delivery that will win our affection over the coming uh, term of the parliament. In nominating uh, the member for Scullin, I wish him every success in his new position and I know that his performance as Speaker will reflect well on the parliament and all of us who serve here. Does the member for Scullin accept nomination? <laughs> Mr Clark, reluctantly, yes, but I do. Is there any further proposal? The time for proposals has expired. I declare that the honourable member proposed, Mr Jenkins, has been elected as Speaker. I wish to express my grateful thanks for the high honour that the House has been pleased to confer upon me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker, for that withering look. Mr Speaker, on behalf of the government, I offer warmest congratulations to your elevation to the office of Speaker of this, the House of Representatives. The Speaker is, in a sense, the referee of the parliament. Your role is to help us play fair and abide by the rules of the House. You will only be the 28th member to have held this office, and I have no doubt you'll perform this role with dignity and with distinction. Some might say, it's in your DNA to do that since your father, Harry Jenkins Sr., also served in the Speaker's role on the election of the Hawke government in 1983 through until 1986. Of course, things have changed a little since Harry Sr.'s day. With the advent of cameras and webcast in the chamber, we're all under greater scrutiny. Members of the public can act now as a kind of parliamentary video referee, watching and reviewing events and basically voting on the dispensation of justice from the chair. This scrutiny is a good thing for us all, for the speakership and for each of us as members of this place. It adds to our modern democracy. Mr Speaker, since 1986, uh, you have been a dedicated representative of the constituents at the seat of Scullin. Now you have the opportunity to serve the whole nation in this important role of speaker. The chair, of course, is not unfamiliar to you. You've served as deputy speaker second Deputy Speaker and Deputy Chair of Committees. In fact, this makes you one of the most experienced of those to be elected to the Office of Speaker in the history of this place. You have therefore seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and from time to time, the very ugly, <laughs> from that chair at close quarters for 18 years. You would have observed the speakerships of Speakers Child, Maclay, Halverson, Martin, Sinclair, Andrews and Hawker. One of the things which we have caused to reflect on running through that list, Mr Speaker, is that those who occupy that position do not have a particular record of longevity. <laughs> <laughs> and may that not be the case in your case, Mr Speaker. From that entire list, though, of uh, previous occupants of the chair, Mr Speaker, you have indeed a rich and innovative set of precedents upon which to draw. 
I imagine also as you grew up uh, with your father there would have been many tales across the dining room table about the reasonableness of government members in those days and the unreasonableness of those opposite. Well, we'll see how this parliament unfolds. You will be aware that the role you are taking on today will not be easy. Uh, many of us are aware of the great story, of course, of the first Speaker of this House, Sir Frederick Holder, who in 1909 rather famously exclaimed, dreadful, dreadful, in response to the events on the floor of the chamber, and then collapsed dead on the floor. <laughs> it has been a common practice, and I think a good one in this House, to remind all incoming speakers of Sir Frederick's demise. <laughs> and while you, Mr Speaker, look to be in excellent health, it would be remiss of you not to pass this on to you. Over the years, this House has seen speakers of many different dispositions. Each of them helped shape the tone and conduct of the parliament in their times. And one thing is certain, at some point all wished, all wished for a better behaved House. Let's hope we can all do better. I don't believe in promising the undeliverable because the responsibility for delivering a better behaved House lies with each and every one of us as members. Of course, we're going to have robust debates in this place. That's the heart and soul and nature of the vibrant Australian democracy, which we know and love and cherish. There will be passion on display. That's been our way. That's the Australian way. It's written very much into our folklore, our past, our history and into our future. But as we express these convictions with passion, let us also show restraint. It is an immense privilege to be part of a democratic parliament where we can express our opinions, a privilege not shared universally across our world. The beliefs we hold to be dear, our goals expressed without fear of retribution, except perhaps the retribution delivered at the ballot box. The office of Speaker is highly esteemed both in our parliament and the House of Commons, our mother parliament as it's described. One of the most respected speakers of the House of Commons, I'm advised, was Arthur Wellesley Peel, who was Speaker of the House from 1884 to 1895. We're advised from the record that um, in an impassioned debate, I think on the Home Rule Bill, there then erupted a physical brawl on the floor of the House. This is in the Mother Parliament, where things are supposed to be done better. The House should be thinking of our new Speaker as I briefly recount what followed as told by an eyewitness cited in Philip Laundy's 1964 tome entitled The Office of the Speaker. And I quote the intervention of the Speaker on that occasion, Mr Speaker. At last the tall gaunt form of the Speaker in wig and gown appeared from behind the chair and there arose from all parts of the chamber a loud shout of greeting in which deep relief was expressed. The cheers were prolonged as the Speaker stood on the platform of the chair facing the House. He did not present the stern and relentless front to which members were accustomed in times of disorder and which they expected to see emphasised at this moment of unutterable shame. He had laid aside even that austerity and remoteness which were habitual with him on ordinary occasions. I thought he looked strangely soft and benign. He was once dignified and gentle, with a simple and yet noble seriousness. Not a hard word had he to say. His voice in asking for explanations of what had happened was quite caressing. Like a parent, wise as well as fond, dealing with a fractious child in a brainstorm, he laid a calming hand on the troubled brow of the house and gently soothed it to order. <laughs> and the house responded to that gentle caress. It became subdued and humble and full of the spirit of reconciliation and atonement, truly a striking manifestation of the force of personality and tact. Mr. Speaker, I leave that exhortation from Speaker Peel for you to reflect on. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is a wonderful day for the members who have today taken their place in the House for the first time, and I congratulate them all on our side of the chamber and on the opposition side of the chamber. It is no greater honour that we can have than be elected to this place as the people's representatives. To be here, each person has fought long and hard in the trenches of our democracy. And to come here as the people's representatives is a high honour indeed, and I congratulate each one of you. No matter how many times we've been part of the first day of a new parliament, we should all remember once again what an honour the Australian people have bestowed on each of us. And for you, Mr Speaker, the day will be particularly memorable. The honour the House has bestowed on you is so clearly deserved. In your own first speech in the House in April of 86, 
You said you were extremely proud to have succeeded your dad as the member for Scullin, and so you should be. Today you have won the right to feel great pride again in joining him in the ranks of the Speakers of the House of Representatives of the Commonwealth Parliament of Australia. On behalf of the government, I congratulate you. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We join with the Prime Minister on congratulating you on your election to this high office as Speaker of the Parliament of Australia. It's a great credit to, to you and your wife, Michelle, and your family and your colleagues uh, that you've been elected to this position. Uh, the respect that we have for you is such uh, that we uh, unanimously across the parliament uh, endorse your election. It was those 22 years ago that you came here following in the footsteps of your father, who would be very proud. And when you came here, your priorities were local government, occupational health and safety, child care, which I'm sure will hold you in good stead over the next three years, <laughs> and also a very, uh, a very strong, I, I know not why they laugh, but, um, <laughs> but uh, also a very strong commitment to justice, peace and humanity. And as we heard in the nominating speeches, we're reminded of the very long service you've given to this parliament. In numerous committees, you've worked very hard, not only for your constituents in Scullin, but right out to, across the parliaments of the world in engaging Australia and our parliamentary processes uh, with that uh, of others. It's also been my observation, uh, having come here in 1996 and certainly that of my colleagues, that you have always treated us with respect, with decency, with courtesy. You've always been firm, but you've always been prepared to give us advice in relation to standing orders and indeed to other things. It's also said, I think, uh, with some justification that when people eventually do leave the parliament, whatever their political or other skills, they're remembered for who they are. And you are one of those people possessed of those qualities which are so essential in being the speaker of this parliament. I welcome also the commitment by the prime minister for accountability, notwithstanding the robust nature of the parliament, uh, which is the bulwark of our democracy, but we welcome nonetheless and will be working very hard to see that uh, we conduct ourselves as the alternative government and the opposition in a manner which does honour to the people that have represented us all. In congratulating you and your family, and it's only those of us who are here, by the way, that have any idea the sacrifices that they have made for you, uh, in recognising all of that, I'd also like uh, to take this opportunity to pay uh, our very high regard and respects to the dignified and very professional manner in which your immediate predecessor, the member for Wannan, conducted himself with the love and support of his wife, Penny. We look forward to working to the best interests of Australia under your speakership over the next three years, and we warmly congratulate you on what you have achieved personally and professionally. The Leader of the Nationals. Well, Mr Speaker, can I join the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition on behalf of the National Party to wholeheartedly extend congratulations to you on your election to this high office. You have indeed classically been the Speaker-in-waiting, serving as Deputy Speaker for over a long period of time with a family tradition indeed in the sense you're sitting in the family seat. And we know that you bring to the office therefore the very best possible practical qualifications having done so much of the work as a deputy over a long period of time. Uh, your practical experience, uh, your warmth of personality, uh, your dignity, your cheery disposition have endeared you to everyone in the House. And, and it is a, a rarely experienced uh, accolade that you have been elected unopposed uh, to this position. And that demonstrates uh, not just the bipartisan support that you enjoy in this office, but the warmth uh, of your colleagues as you assume this office. I read in, in, report, in papers uh, uh, some months ago that there are others who coveted the position, but I am pleased that you have been selected by your party and the parliament in this way to take this high office. You are the custodian of the, of the traditions of the parliament. You are the custodian of the rights of individual members, and so that's a very, very important responsibility. Uh, the parliament, as others have said, will sometimes be the place of robust political debate, 
heated exchange and you will have an umpiring or refereeing role, depending on which code you happen to come from, uh, to make sure that that's carried out in an appropriate way, without in any way unnecessarily or inappropriately restricting uh, the rights of members to have their say on issues that are of particular importance. We will certainly seek to cooperate with you in your ambition to, to have a House that is appropriate to the highest pinnacles of the, the, the democratic principles of our country, that gives the opportunity to effectively scrutinise the government, gives members, particularly private members, an opportunity to raise matters that are of importance to them and make a meaningful contribution towards political debate in this country. It is, as the Prime Minister said, a great privilege for us all to serve in this place. And uh, your leadership in, in the chair will help ensure that members will be able to effectively carry out uh, their responsibilities to, electorate, to their electorates to fearlessly represent their people. Finally, can I join the Leader of the Opposition in thanking the member for Wanna uh, for his role as your predecessor. He also brought uh, great experience uh, to the position, uh, dedication and dignity. He faced the challenges under fire. And sometimes uh, he was driven to anger, uh, sometimes justifiably, about the sort of things that happened in the chamber, but he sought to create order and to ensure that the business of the parliament was able to proceed. So we thank him very much for his role as speaker and wish him every success uh, in the future. Uh, congratulations, Mr Speaker, on your elevation. Let me assure you of our desire and willingness to cooperate with you to ensure that there are high standards in this place and most particularly that the business of government, the business of the parliament, is conducted with the kind of decorum that the people of Australia will always expect. Best wishes. The member for Wannan. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I too would like to join with the Prime Minister, with the Leader of the Opposition and with the Leader of the National Party in congratulating you wholeheartedly on your elevation to the high office of the Speaker. As has been mentioned uh, in your previous role, I add that uh, I was very fortunate to be able to work with you as one of my deputy speakers, and I appreciated the way you always in a totally professional and genuine way, uh, worked in a, to cooperate to make sure that the business of the House was uh, undertaken uh, in an orderly fashion and we made sure that uh, this great chamber continued to work as we'd all liked it. As has been mentioned, you are a very experienced member of parliament and you've had nearly 12 years as the deputy and I think justifiably you have earned the respect of both sides of this chamber and that, I think, is an essential part of being able to undertake this very important role. I have uh, every confidence that you will uphold the dignity of the House, and I think um, you'll continue to maintain the very important part that Parliament plays in the democratic processes of this country. And uh, I was uh, reminded to look in the House of Representatives' practice, when, uh, particularly when I heard the Prime Minister quoting uh, Philip Lawney, and uh, in the practice it uh, mentions the role of the Speaker plays by virtue of the office requires the position to be filled by a dedicated, senior and experienced parliamentarian. The qualities required in a Speaker have been described in the following ways. It is parliamentary rather than legal experience which is the first requirement of a Speaker. He must have an intimate understanding of parliamentary life of the problems of members collectively and individually, of the moods and foibles of the House, an experience which can, un can be acquired only through many years spent on the benches of the House itself. He must have a deep-seated reverence for the institution of Parliament, an understanding of what lies behind the outward ceremony and a faith in democratic government. And I think on all counts, Mr Speaker, uh, you qualify. And with 21 years in Parliament prior to becoming Speaker, which coincidentally is the same time that uh, I spent prior to becoming Speaker. Uh, I believe that your knowledge of procedures, your understanding of parliamentary life and, of course, your experience all equip you extremely well for this most important role. Um, 
You are the, actually the 26th person to be Speaker of the Parliament, and uh, for that uh, I certainly congratulate you. Uh, to clarify, there were two speakers who served on two separate occasions. Um, it's also, I think, significant, I must add, that seven of the last 11 speakers have come from the great state of Victoria. <laughs> so, uh, no doubt, um, we'll, we'll leave that one, but <laughs> I'm sure that you also share with me um, in saying uh, to all the new members of this parliament on both sides, uh, we wish you every success and we trust that you will acquire a deep commitment to this House and become true parliamentarians, as I think all of you probably well, certainly would aspire to. Mr Speaker, may I, may I just add, it has been a great privilege to be the Speaker in the 41st Parliament, to work with so many fine Australians and uh, to have the privilege to be supported by such a professional team in the House led by the clerk and his deputy and the sergeant and all the staff who work in the Department of the House and the Department of Parliamentary Services. And can I thank the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the National Party for their kind remarks. And I'd also uh, like to thank my own sp uh, staff and my wife and family for the support that they have given, us, uh, given me and uh, as yours will give you. For me, this is also a rather unique occasion because almost 25 years ago, after being sworn in as the new member for Wannan, I was welcomed by the Speaker, Dr Harry Jenkins, the member for Scala. And today, we congratulate the Honourable Harry Jenkins, the member for Scala, as the Speaker. Mr Speaker, your father would be very proud of you. I know your family and your mother, who are here today, are very proud of you, and I wish you every success in this very important role. May I thank the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Nationals, the Member for Wannan, for their kind remarks. I'm not sure that I'll be able to emulate Speaker Peel's Zen-like qualities. <laughs> Can I say that quite correctly mention has been made of the role that the member for Wannan played in the 41st Parliament as our Speaker. It was a privilege to serve him as a Deputy Speaker. And over the last couple of months, when there's been a transition period, I think that he has exemplified the way in which he conducts himself by being of great assistance to make me feel that I was part of a transition that was to be smooth so that the workings of this parliament could continue. And I thank David and Penny for their great kindness to both myself, Michelle and my family. To my mover and seconder, I thank them. They join a long list of colleagues that have moved and seconded my nomination for both Speaker and Deputy Speaker. Of course, they are amongst the more successful, having engineered a, an election uh, without opponent. I don't know whether they actually really had anything to do with that. But I say to them that despite their efforts as nominee and seconder, they get no special privileges. Along with the rest of the urges that are to my right, uh, they are on notice. <laughs> I hope that those on my left will allow me a slight indulgence as I indicate my great pride that former Prime Minister Whitlam is in the gallery at the time of my election. For me and my development in my political career, uh, Gough has been a very important aspect of my life. To my family that is in the gallery, my mother, wife, two sons, daughter, daughter-in-law <laughs> and granddaughter who has nearly had to absent herself because she's demanding equal time, <laughs> my parents-in-law, my brother, sister and niece, 
I've been very lucky to have that stable support for family. I reflect that I'm just a product of the northern suburbs of Melbourne. I have the opportunity of representing an electorate that is the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Perhaps I've been from a slightly more privileged background than the people that I represent. But I've had the great honour, and I hope that the people of Scullin see that this is a great honour that's bestowed upon them to have their representative elevated to this high office. The member for Wannan mentioned the staff of the House of Representatives, the clerks. I should admit that I've been very, a very difficult occupant of this chair from time to time for the clerk and the deputy clerks. I hope that they will continue to excuse my stubbornness and understand that I do listen to them and I look forward to a cooperative relationship with them. Today, before the formal proceedings of the parliament, a welcome to country was conducted in the members' hall. Matilda House talked about proper respect. And I think that from all the comments that have been made today that members of this House understand that by the way in which we are able to respect each other, we then in turn respect those people that we represent. We respect the nation of Australia. Mention is made that I follow on from Speaker Dr Jenkins. From the outset, it was never my intention that that would, would necessarily occur, but I acknowledge that it is a footnote in history that is important. Some 25 years ago, I was in the front row of the gallery in the provisional parliament house. When I looked down on the chamber there, a much different atmosphere. Three members of this place were there on that day, the father of the house, the member for Barara, who's had a very distinguished career in this place. The member for O'Connor. Can I say that <laughs> can I say that his is a much larger footnote in the history of parliamentary procedure? And the third was and it's impossible to believe with such a youthful looking character as the member for Gippsland, an even younger looking member for Gippsland, who had arrived in this place for his first day. As the Prime Minister mentioned, proceedings were much different in the old chamber. It was only across the radio. We now, as the Prime Minister mentioned, have the televising and webcast. We are a much more modern parliament than 25 years ago. And that, of course, is one of the great challenges that we confront. To all of you, I wish you all the best in your endeavours. I hope that through my actions, I am able to assist you in achieving those things that you wish to achieve. I once again thank the House for the great honour that they have bestowed upon me. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I have ascertained that it will be His Excellency the Governor-General's pleasure to receive you, Mr Speaker, in the Members' Hall immediately after the resumption of the sitting at 2.30 p.m. Order. Prior to my presentation to His Excellency this afternoon, the bells will ring for five minutes so that honourable members may attend in the chamber and accompany me to the Members' Hall when they may, if they wish, be introduced to His Excellency. The sitting is suspended until 2.30 p.m.